Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. My name is Keshav and I'm the producer for this episode. Today's conversation is with Carolyn Sissons, who's the CEO of the Finance Learning Lab, which is a company that creates and hosts finance workshops to help employees and entrepreneurs build the concepts and tools they need to, to operate their business in an e-learning environment. Uh, Carolyn's a graduate of University of Ottawa's BCom program, where she majored in accounting, and since then began her career with KPMG. And following that, Carolyn spent many years working in the energy sector in Alberta, actually, where she runs her business today. Um, and during that time working in the energy sector, she obtained her CMA, PMP, CIA, and MBA designations. So quite a few, and um, she gets into detail about those uh, designations and why she chose to do them. And she really joined Sam to discuss her transition from the corporate world to being an entrepreneur. And they examined how, you know, it can be really important to take a step back from your social and financial situations to really understand what you want, uh, what makes you happy, and often, as she puts it, uh, dabbling with new ideas to really find out what you want to do. And she's a big believer that choosing your peer group very carefully can impact uh, your outcomes and and choosing who you spend your time with and how to select those people are incredibly important. And she made a point to mention that several times. Uh, she's also a believer that rejection from a job that often you may have always wanted uh, could be a blessing in disguise because it, at least for her, helped her find a way to get her on a different path to her success and become creative with her career. Um, as always, I've uh, linked Sam's information in the description to the YouTube video and as well, uh, info to, to Carolyn, how to contact her, her emails in the description, her LinkedIn, and also uh, her website. So take care and uh, enjoy. All right. So welcome. We have started recording. Welcome, Carolyn. How are you doing? Doing great. Excited to be here. Thanks, Samantha. Excited to have you. So before we kind of jump right in, um, why don't we tell people how we know each other? <laughs> so I think that I reached out to you. So I run a business in Calgary and I think that I reached out to you trying to say, Hey, do you know any students? We're trying to recruit some students for our internship program. So I think I might've just like cold messaged you. And I think it might've turned into this because we both have roots in Calgary and also in Halifax. Yes. So, yeah. So I, it was important for me to show our, like the students that yeah, you reached out. We had been connected for a while. I don't know who made the connection. We probably have a lot of people. Um, I worked in a regulated industry back when I was in Calgary. Um, you're from the East Coast. So there's a lot of crossover there. And so, yeah, when you let me know that you are hiring um, for your business, which we'll absolutely delve into um, <laughs> so super soon, um, but I don't, I don't want to spoil, not spoil it, but we, we got to get there a little bit. Um, in I, when you reached out, I was like, oh, well, what an perfect opportunity to kind of get the students to get to know somebody who has really, um, you know, from my point of view, lived her definition of success and kind of worked towards her goals and didn't do just one thing. So um, when you reached out about the job, I reached out about doing recording. The <laughs> and <laughs> okay, so here we are. <laughs> yeah. <such> small world. <laughs> so uh, just to set the stage now. Hmm, so you are a CPA. Uh, CMA, and you got some other letters going on. So <laughs> you, how about we briefly spoke before we started recording that you did your undergrad. It was a commerce undergrad? Yes, I did a commerce undergrad specializing in accounting. Yeah, and it was with Ottawa U. So I was, yeah, I was in Ottawa. I did the co-op program, um, but yeah, traditional undergrad degree in commerce specializing in accounting. Wow, okay. And then did you go and do your CMA, did you go into industry right away or how, what kind of led you into that next chapter? I did. So I, um, I moved to Halifax. So that's kind of my connection mm. back to you, Dal, and to yourself. So I lived in Halifax. I worked at KPMG for about a year and I worked in public practice. So I kind of thought after I finished school, I'm going to do kind of the traditional route of go get your CA designation. I know it's combined now, but at the time it was your, your CA route. Um, so I worked in public practice in audit assurance and I hated it to be honest um good people nothing, nothing wrong with it yep. but I kind of had a I guess you can't call it a midlife crisis I had a, a kind of a crisis of I spent all of these years studying you know kind of dedicated so much time to accounting and I really didn't like it and so I thought mm -hmm. what am I going to do so I did something that I would recommend no one do you should not oh. follow my advice but um I I quit my job I packed up my apartment packed everything up into my car and moved out to Calgary I didn't know a soul out here I had no job lined up all I knew is 
I don't want to do accounting. And that was kind of, um, <laughs> eventually I did go back towards the accounting route, but that was, um, that was kind of how I first started going down that path. I um, did find a job pretty much while I was still driving out. I mean, it's a long from, a long, from yeah, California yeah. to Calgary is a long drive. Um, and so on the way out, I've got a role with the provincial government um, in, a, in Calgary. So it was with the Department of Energy. So it was my first kind of entryway into the energy sector. And um, it was entry level role. It, it was it was great. But I realized after a few months that I probably acted a little bit rashly. Um, and I started looking at, you know, OK, you know, do I really want to stay entry level role the rest of my career? And then I started kind of eventually moved back at the time there weren't industry opportunities to do your um to do different paths so I, I actually first went to my um CIA which is an internal audit designation so I went down that path and um then I found more and more to be able to advance you really needed a traditional accounting designation so I did the um CMA program I loved it I found it it was a really good fit for me it was a lot of managerial aspects it was it was kind of um it took the it I saw more application for what mm -hmm. I was really interested in doing. So um, I went down that way and then I just kind of, I, I don't know if I intentionally ever set out to be like, I want to accumulate every letter in the alphabet, but um, I, I kind of continued on. So I got a PMP designation, which is project management. And, right. and it was, um, I think, more complementary skill sets. Mm -hmm. so it was good to have as, you know, you might not think as an accountant that you would want to have project management skills, but it was a really good fit. So, um, yeah. so I kind of branched into that. And then um, more recently- Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. how far are you? So, yeah, that's can, my, my we know, more things going on. So I just want to highlight a few things here. And you said you wouldn't recommend it. Um, and I find that like packing up your car and leaving, I don't, you know, I'm just going to push back a little bit in the sense yeah. that sometimes <laughs> when we know we want to do something, um, we need to, you know, rip the bandage off and like put ourselves in a situation where we feel so uncomfortable that we need to, you know, make it work. And you probably looked at the risks, like you looked at who was relying on you and your income. And it sounds like it was you and, you know, what kind of risk tolerance you could stomach and what was the worst that can happen? What was the best thing that could happen? And, you know, when you were driving into Calgary, Calgary used to be where, you know, if you walked into a place, um, like, you know, it's not like a necessarily an entry level job, but if you walked into say retail, you could have like a job like that, that day. And so it's very like low barriers to entry, um, for, for very, like for not, um, for kind of retail level or restaurant level jobs. Um, but then the whole economy was kind of just like bustling. Like you'd have, you know, people getting severance packages and then getting new jobs the same day and just like, just ridiculously bumping. So if you have a good, you know, skill set, which you did, you had a solid, yeah. Um, undergrad, you had KPMG experience and you were betting on yourself, essentially yeah, you were betting yeah. on yourself. Um, right. and just because it didn't line up in like the boxes that you're supposed to tick, like you put yourself in a position to figure shit out and make it work, which I think is really commendable. You're right. I like the more I think back, I'm like it wasn't quite as great. Like it, I think it was kind of like the people around me were, yes. you know, my parents that kind of helped me through, through schools, so which I'm very grateful for. So they kind of looked at it and they said, what are you doing you know, from their perspective? But, but in fairness, I guess to myself, kind of when I think through that lens, you know, I, I did actually look at it and there was a significant, um, there was a significant pay difference at that point in time. So you're right. Calgary was booming. Like I said, I had no plan for whenever I had gotten there. The biggest worry was vacancies, finding apartments were crazy, um, but finding jobs, no problem. So as I was driving out, I got a job lined up on the way. So there was definitely a ton of opportunity out there at that time. And, and it was probably somewhat more like it was a calculated risk. I think you could yes. say, because I looked at my cost of living in Calgary and I kind of anticipated what my cost of living would be in Cal um, Calgary versus Halifax. Yeah. And the differential was um, it was more expensive at the time in Calgary, but not dramatically more expensive mm -hmm. and positions paid double. So even if I didn't, the, the upside was there. So, yeah. so yeah, maybe it wasn't quite as irrational when I kind of think there might've been yeah. more of a, and I, and I put back on it because, you know, when I articled, um, I quit before finding out about results and people were like, that's crazy. What are you doing? And there was, there's some serious, you know, when you're in it, it feels like an elephant, right? Like I feel yeah. when you go against what is normal or you have something that people, you know, perhaps would want and you decide, Hey, that's not for me. Um, yeah. I almost find that there's two kind of groups. One are like the haters, which you yeah. can kind of like 
I don't know, it's easier to like parse them out. And then it's the well-intentioned like friends and family that, yes. that are hard to like, yes. cause they make you, you know, they're coming from a good place. And then you're like, should I, you know, um, sub substitute my judgment for their judgment or what's going on here. So when you bet on yourself and you say, no, if I, I'd rather kind of fail yeah. on me rather than succeed by somebody else's definition, like this is what we're going to do. So like yes. kudos and, yeah. and I absolutely can, so I can speak to being part of the profession, the CA profession in the education side. Uh, before the merger and then being part of the CPA, um, you know, post-merger and absolutely. So in the CPA stream, um, when you can article uh, in industry and you can take your management accounting, your strategy and governance, and you can, your PM elective, uh, and then you can also take your finance, absolutely, you know, um, and, and kind of get through without doing a giant um, immersive in like taxation for eight weeks yeah. or even, even audit. Like you said, you worked in internal audit. So you're familiar with the audit like framework and the purpose, um, but not necessarily, it's a different, as you experience with KPMG, like it's just a different being it's external different versus lens. internal. Exactly. Like it's definitely, I really like the, like the decision-making aspect of things. So I found like that was more of a fit. So I've done the traditional statutory external audit and I've done the internal audit. And for me, internal audit, I really liked because you're looking at operational aspects. You're looking at, you know, what KPIs, you're yeah. looking at compliance and contracts and you're, there's a lot of diversity there. So it was just a good fit for what I was interested in, but yeah, totally. And I hear you like the, the well-intended advice is so dangerous like and and you don't realize how dangerous it is because it's people that love you and care about you and they're giving it from a good place yes. um I face the same thing even when I was kind of looking at like do I start a business do I not start a business and it was like people that I know are coming from a good place are saying like well well you know like don't do it think of the risk think of the failure think of the all of those and they mean well but it doesn't it, it doesn't mean that you should listen to it yes yeah, absolutely. It's part of the landscape, but it doesn't need to be your story. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, we got up to PMP. And by the way, I just want to ask you, when you were um, adding on uh, to your repertoire of skills, um, sometimes students um, will say to me, okay, well, I'm going to do this degree and then I'm going to get this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. How much of it was that kind of well thought out, you know, ahead of time and like, I mean, how much of it was when you're doing the job, you realize, hey, maybe there is something that would help me level up to get to the next spot, or maybe there's a little bit of a skill set that I'm missing, or, you know, what was your kind of decision making going into, um, going from getting your PMP? Yeah, all of them were not particularly planned out. Um, I, I knew when I was doing my undergrad, I knew at, at that point that I was going to do an accounting designation other than the blip of time where I was, you know, I kind of went through that career where I was like not. Um, but the other ones were more opportunistic. It was, um, I was really lucky to be in a lot of the right spots at the right time. So for example, um, we, whenever I was at the Department of Energy, we had um, a leader that kind of came in, they said, like, we really want to invest in our people. And we really want people to kind of continue to grow. And so one of my coworkers at the time was kind of almost bragging about, you know, since I finished university, I haven't taken any more courses. And, and he almost viewed it as like a badge of honor. And I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> and um, whereas I was like, this is phenomenal. So you're saying that you will fully fund me to do these different courses. All I need to do is invest the time to learn. Yes, it's evenings. Yes, it's weekends. Yes, it's going to be hard work, but you are actually going to pay the tuition for me. And I said, this is, this is an amazing deal. There's no, there's no downside to it. Um, so, so I kind of said, if, like, why, why would you not do it? Yeah. Um, and so it's just been a, a progression of different opportunities that kind of came along the way, but opportunities where I think I usually advocated for it. You know, no one came knocking on my door saying, Hey, you know, do you want to do your, your CIA designation? You know, when I look at the rest of the analysts that I was working with in those entry-level roles, anyone could have done the exact same thing. You know, anyone could have gone to our boss and put forward a proposal and said, you know, Hey, can we, you know, get tuition for this? So you have to be the one to put the pitch. Um, so I did do that and they, they paid for it. Um, but there were so many people that, that really could have done the exact same thing, but for whatever reason, they stayed in their comfort zone. Um, so I, I've definitely kind of looked for the right times and, um, have kind of like found when there's an opportunity and when there seems to be budget available for training. And I've said like, 
if I, I'm a big believer that like bet on yourself, bet on your education hundred percent of the time. So I've usually kind of like waited to see like, Hey, when is there a good opportunity? And whenever it makes sense, I, I'm like, yeah, I I'll, I'll absorb anything that I can. Cause there's, there's so much you can learn. Absolutely. And looking at, like you said, with the PMP, not necessarily being like a logical next step, but seeing, hey, this would absolutely be complementary uh, to what you were doing and the right opportunity, right time, the business case was there that was verified by leadership uh, and investing uh, in yourself and working at a company that also saw that and valued that, which is likely why, you know, it worked out well for them to get kind of invest in your employees. That old meme that always populates around uh, LinkedIn every every six months or so. It's what is it? It's like the CFO that's like, what if we invest in our employees and they leave? And the CEO looks at them and says, what if we don't and they stay? Exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've actually included that in some of our like company proposals that I put together. Like I, I love that one because it's so true, right? Like, and and I think this is what people end up forgetting is like 99% of us and, and our roles, if we're not in an industrial environment anymore, where you're at 99% of your people and, and your costs are going to be knowledge costs. Mm-hmm. It, it's not really anything else. Like what you're paying for in your company is people and if you're not investing in your people and you're not training and, and do, then like it's to me it's absolutely mind-blowing that companies don't go further into that um you know we, we we go through school and you spend you know 12 years in high school and then four years doing an undergrad and then all of a sudden we think that you move into the, the workplace and you're going to spend you know a day or two a year on training and I'm like okay that might have worked in the past but okay, you know, yeah. Yeah, even just like intuitively looking at the landscape and looking at things like whizzing by, like don't you want somebody on that train like whizzing by with you you and your company? Uh, So no, and that's also something to kind of keep in mind as, you know, business owners and as educators and just to be a part of this and to constantly be pushing back at things and saying, okay, that's how it's been done. And that's great to learn from. It's always nice. Um, But that doesn't necessarily mean, if anything, it maybe means that that's not how should it, how it should be going forward. So, you know, if you look around yourself and you have, I don't know, nine other analysts just to make a round number and you're the 10th and they're not doing anything, it's easy to say, well, if they're not doing it, that maybe I shouldn't do it either. But it's that moment when you have that thought, you're like, oh, I I want something more. I want a challenge. I want to add this on. Then go for it. Listen to that voice. That's like, I want to do this and not what's the norm, but rather, you know, what is your gut telling you? Because your gut is taking in all this information and you are, you're essentially the guru of you. So, um, but thank you for giving us kind of tactics and like business cases in order to kind of show how you can do it, because we're also battling with, um, people tend to see like the student class right now is like the me generation. And I have to tell them that like every generation is also called the me generation. So it's not just you, like it it was us and it was the people before us. Like it's, we're all the selfish ones. Um, (laughs) but it's, it's nice to kind of say, okay, it's okay to be involved in yourself and to advocate for yourself and not be selfish. These are two totally different things. Exactly. I think you have to, like, I really think if you don't advocate for yourself, you, you have to advocate for yourself. And I think the other thing you're mentioning kind of about like the, the nine versus the, the, the nine different analysts, I think you have to be so careful who you choose as your peer group, because you're choosing your peer group. And if, if I had kind of taken the same approach and chose that, you know, this is my peer group and this is what they're doing, you'll still, you'll have the same outcome of what they're getting. So you have to be so, so cautious to say like, where do I want to go? And the people that are where I want to go, what are they doing? And mentally like figure out a way to kind of like think like, what would I do if that was my peer group versus what would I do if I kind of viewed this as my peer group? So I I just think you have to be so careful who you choose. Absolutely. And I don't know what you about yourself, but now I actually look for people that aren't necessarily like straight up accountants. Um, you know, I like, like my industry people. I like my, um, my public practice people. I love, um, everybody, but I'm also like, I'm fascinated with like data scientists. I'm like, let's go for coffee. I'm like, what do you do? Um, like, how do you think? Um, and I'm so curious and just hearing about people and like, in their expertise. And then sometimes there's overlap and sometimes it's just a great conversation or it's a great mini conversation. It's, I, how about yourself? Do you? Totally. It's those different perspectives. Like it is, it's totally, you can learn so much from some different disciplines, especially data science. If you think about what you, if, if I kind of think like trends in accounting, you know, there's going to be 
but I, I can't see how like eventually in the future there isn't some kind of convergence between data mm -hmm. science and um, accounting, especially like the forecasting and future oriented pieces. Like there's such an alignment there that you can learn from the two different disciplines. So yeah, I, I but I think the more even like one of the things that I've done um, since COVID is still watch Netflix probably more than I should admit. Um, but what I've tried to do is um, switch it occasionally to masterclass. And so it's the mm -hmm. same concept. You get a subscription there. Um, but I've started watching different classes on documentary filmmaking, um, story writing, creative writing, um, all these different disciplines. And you would not think like uh, documentary filmmaking, I didn't mention, but like all these different screenwriting. And it's actually even though in a very broad, like it, it, it broadens your perspective mm -hmm. and it's even helped me in my business in a way that like, I never would have thought that creative writing would ever have anything to do with like, I'm an accountant. Like, how does that relate to me? But it does. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, I want to launch into that a bit more. So at this point we are, we are three sets of letters in, I think maybe a fourth with the <laughs> CPA merger. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then is that it? Is that where the train ended? Was it PMP or were there some more letters that you uh, invested in yourself for? I did my MBA as well. So I did that uh, with Athabasca out here. So it was, um, so, so about me, um, I am a, a single mom. So it's just myself and my daughter. So a traditional MBA program was not going to work because there's no way that I could have um, you know, found a babysitter, all those different evenings. So yeah. it, was, it was a really good program. Um, you could do it at your own pace. Um, and again, it was baby steps. So um, what ended up happening was I was looking at my professional development for that particular year. Um, and it was kind of my accident. So it was, I was looking at um, taking a particular course, got approval for that particular course. Um, the course got canceled for unrelated reasons. It just got canceled. Um, so I was like, what am I going to do? I still want to do something. Um, and this MBA program actually allowed you to kind of just dabble and take a course before you're in the full way. Oh, so right. I, um, I said to my, to my boss, I'm like, you know, could I just take this money you're going to spend on it and put it towards this course, which I would have the option in the future of kind of continuing on for my MBA. So that's what I did. So I kind of was able to get um, some individual components of it. You know, you kind of get the employer to foot the bill for, yeah. for some of those that tuition. Yeah, and, um, and I kind of just started with like a little bit of like a dabble because I wasn't sure if I was going to, you know, I went through the application process, but I knew I would have kind of a gap there if I said it's too much, I have too much workload on, yeah. I have too many other things at least. Um, but I, I loved it actually. And it, it worked out really well. And it was, yeah, I, I actually really... I guess I get a little bit nerdy with learning, but I, I enjoy it. So, <laughs> so yeah. anybody that's listening to this, um, that anyways, took any of my classes, I absolutely uh, nerd out with learning. Um, I did my <laughs> master's in education. Um, and so it's like learning sciences and how the brain works and like working smarter, not harder. And like, you know, just different things that you can integrate with what you're doing. Um, it's so I don't worry. People that are listening to this are likely like, Oh, oh no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Oh, like I'm the biggest believer in like the whole, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of like the Carol Dweck fixed mindset versus growth mindset, yes. but I, Big fan. I am a huge fan of it. Like, I, I just think the more you learn, the more you're able to learn. And I just, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of my, I don't know if I say like learning is my hobby, but like, I do, I love it. Like I really, really do. Well, and I think learning, we're also able to contribute in different ways, like by being, you know, quote selfish and learning ourselves, we're also able to share that. And when we get kind of those indicators from other people, they want to hear more. It's like, whoa, uh, yeah. but, you know, um, with the Carol Dweck thing, um, you know, grow the pie. Don't just figure out a way to cut it up the pie a bit more, right? Like grow it. Like I want you to win. I want to win. Like let's, um, so one of the uh, podcasts that I listened to that my, my Dean actually put on um, for the future of management um, part three is uh, Dean, Dean Jewald of the University of Calgary, where I went, um, mentioned that he surveys the incoming class, uh, like, why are you here? And a small portion of the students will be like, my parents made me. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but the, um, the overwhelming, like rest of them were split 50, 50. Yeah. Some of them are there to make profit. Like they want to make bank. Yeah. Other 50% want, are there to make a purpose. And so, you know, bridging that gap, it's like, no, no, no. Like you can make a purpose um, and, you know, and be profitable. Like it's not, it doesn't need to be an either or. So that is in line with how I see um, Carol Dweck's like grow the pie, be creative, you know, have a B Corp, 
um, work for a not-for-profit, you know, just, you know, go out there and do what lights you up. And when that changes and shifts, cool, go change and shift with it. We briefly talked um, right before this call about, you know, you do not need to be one thing. You can be many things. So you can be many things at the same time, or you can be many things um, in your life, but don't, don't waste it. And don't, don't wait for permission. Right. Exactly. Like it's, you have to, you have to just, yeah, you don't wait for permission. If you yeah. wait for permission, like I, I like, I, I really think one of the things that kept me stuck. So I kind of done like the corporate, the traditional corporate career for a long, long time. And I was almost waiting for permission to be able to leave. I knew for probably, probably 10 years in the back of my mind, probably since day one, but really strongly felt like that way for six years. And then it, like, I feel like I was waiting for someone to give me permission to say, yes, now is the time to, to leave, to go start a business. And finally I realized I'm like, no one's going to give me that permission. Like it's who am I, who am I waiting for this permission from? Like it's, it's self permission. And, and that's why I think like your peer group matters so, so much because I was surrounded by really great, really wonderful people, but they were also living in the model of, I had zero friends that were entrepreneurs. Um, I like 99% of the people that I was surrounded with were other people that got a secure, stable corporate job and you work that job. And that was the only model that they knew. So they're trying to give a good piece of advice, mm -hmm. which is, you know, oh, all these businesses fail, you know, this is what you end up hearing. So they're like, yeah. you know, we, we care about you, you know, why would you leave this? Like you have a good thing going, like, why would you do something like that? And it's well-intended, um, but yeah, like, you, you can't expect that the people that are around you are going to say, you know, today's the day that you should hand in your resignation and start your business. No, who's going to give you that piece of paper? Like you give it to yourself. Like, <laughs> yeah, like the reverse, yeah. like you're doing really good at your job, but we would like you to leave now. Now it is time. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So, and it's okay. like, it took me six years. So I was like a law, it was How a did law. you know? It was a process. And yeah. like many of us, people ask like, oh, how did you know you wanted to be a prof? And I'm like, um, I, like, I'm still figuring out what I want to do when I grow up, but this is an amazing, you can love where you're at right now. Like I love it. And I could see myself doing this. Yeah. But if someday there's something else that pulls me, you know, you got to listen to those and weigh those out. So for yourself, um, how did you know? You said it was percolating, but what was, was there a specific like point in time or decision <sighs> or like, what was the tipping point that, yeah. you know, made you write that email or pick up the phone and, and put in your resignation? I, I think it was accelerated by COVID. Um, so it was, I think there was like the, the slow, small little things that were percolating. And then I don't even know what triggered like this, the day to be like, today is the day. Um, the slow piece was, um, I started dabbling. So I, I started learning, you know, how do you create a website? How do you, like, I just started like, so you were dabbling my, with this. Uh, were you still in your MBA? I was done my MBA, um, but I was just finishing up. I think I was just finishing up my MBA, oh, but even okay. I was in my MBA, I knew that I really like, it, like it was six years in the making of like corporate isn't for me. And I tried mm -hmm. everything, you know, I tried different companies. I tried different functions. I tried different, I tried everything. And then I was like, why am I not fitting into this particular mold? And I thought it was like, what's wrong with me? Like, why do I not fit into this particular mold? So I knew, um, and I knew at some point, like I, I like learning some of these entrepreneurial skills were going to be helpful. So I just kind of like dabbled. So I used, um, I used Udemy, but you can use pretty much any of them. And I think I spent like $15 and bought, um, how to create a website type of course. So I did that. And then I think I did a few more just in like coding and some more technical skills. And I was like, okay, interesting. But I had no idea what my business plan was going to be because I would come up with all of these ideas and I, I would look at them and I'd be like, there's no, like, there's, I, I would compare like my salary versus the potential with that business. And I'd be like, well, this makes no sense. It's not like, it's not going to work. So I just didn't see another option, but I just, I kept like very slowly, mm -hmm. like dabbling. Um, I just want to say, I like, I love the word dabble because it's like these little mini bets or, you know, proof of concepts and it's, you know, low, low risk, but high information because, yeah. you know, if you, I don't know about yourself, but I can think of things where I can't even remember all the things that I've dabbled in where I'm like, oh, no, that's not for me. But yeah. the ones that like do work out, you can look backwards and you see a straight line. So exactly. you look like a genius yeah. in, in yeah. hindsight. In and while you're going through it, it's exactly. like, well, why not? Like, why yeah. not try? Exactly. I was a dabbler for a long time. So I had done, um, there was a, I think it was called Calgary startup weekend, but you go for a whole weekend, you pitch an idea. Um, they put you in teams. It's almost like a school, um, like a management program essentially, but you, you go, um, 
like a school project, I guess I should say, but over the course of the weekend, you put together a minimum viable product and then you pitch it to VC. So like I've been dabbling in some of that. I had done the same thing. I had read that book, um, hundred dollar startup. So, um, I took hundred dollars, my, this, my business like, was, was not very good. Um, at the time I, my daughter was really young. So I was like learning how to crochet all these cute little baby things. So I started a crochet collective. I got the little stall set up at the farmer's market. We made a grand total of like $37 that day. And I probably bought $30 worth of the product myself. So like, it, it was not, it was not particularly viable. But business, it's fantastic but because you <laughs> did it, right? Like I that's did. the hardest part. Yeah, um, yeah. We shared a brief moment about, you know, our shared love for Tim Ferriss. And one of his things is, what is it? Like go up and negotiate at Starbucks, like for your coffee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still haven't done that one. And his <laughs> other is like randomly go to a place and just lay on the ground. Lay down. That yes, that's caused awesome. my heart pounds. The thought of doing. I've not reached the point of doing that one. The Starbucks, I might get to the point of like, hey, will you give me a free coffee? But then just like go to a store <laughs> or like lay on the ground. Be I, I'm not there yet. <laughs> what about 2.30? Would you take 2.30? <laughs> <laughs> but no, like what you did though, is you, yeah. you just did it right. Yeah. So often, like so many times you talked about already, like the permission or, you know, oh, like, even if you knew the outcome to do that is brave, right. Is to say, you know, I'm going to spend $30 and, um, I might make zero and I'm going to sit yeah. there and I'm going to sit there and I can choose to own it and like be there and be proud of yourself, regardless of the outcome. Or you can sit there and kind of worry and wonder about that energy. So tell me, what was going through your mind when you were sitting there with your crochet collective? Like what, what was going through your mind and how did you, like, were you excited or scared or nervous? Or uh, I think I realized partway through the day that it was not the right business. So I kind of decommitted throughout the day. So I, I, I literally had kind of said like, this is just, this is intended um, really just to dabble into them. So yeah. I really, I didn't actually intend to start um, a crochet business, but it was more so like, okay, just get myself get into it. Out there. Um, I, I partway through the day, I think I could tell that it was a flop. So I didn't keep my motivation going the way that I probably should have, but, um, it was still good to do. And you know what? It was really cool because I was able to talk to some of the other vendors. So there were some other people at the farmer's market that were in like the food business, you know, like that's a lot of what they end up selling there. And it was just good to kind of see like, actually that yeah, you can do something, you can make it happen. Um, we didn't do any marketing. We kind of found, a, I'd found a meetup group and I kind of thrown a, a post on there. And like, it was cool just to be like, yeah, you can actually make something happen. Um, it was tiring though. It was super tiring. And I think after that, I was like, okay, no, this is, um, I didn't actually go from that to like, yeah, I need to do entrepreneurship. I think I almost took a few steps back and I was like, okay, I actually didn't enjoy that. It kind of, I think it, it was a good thing to do, but it actually, um, had me kind of go back and rethink. And I was like, okay, this didn't quite work out, but I'm still glad I had done it. It was a good experience okay. to go through. Absolutely. And so many things like putting yourself out there is hard, right? Yeah. Um, putting yourself out there on the internet is hard. Putting yourself out there physically is hard. Um, so you did it and it wasn't like a, an out of the park home run, but yeah. who cares? You did it and you can, you know, stand up tall. And then I think it's cool that you also used it as research to yeah. hear what other people were doing. And yeah. I don't know about you, but um, so often it's, you get so much information out of what you don't want to do or what the things that you doesn't look good. And it's not like you sunk, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of like dollars and hours into it. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. It was just like a micro bet. Like it was just a, like a micro little experiment. So yeah, it was, yeah. Like I'm glad I went through it and I've like, I very much approached things as like, just try little things, just yeah. Dabbling. I think what we were saying, like that yeah. is the way, that's the way to go because you don't know until you get into it. Dabble is now in my repertoire for like from here on out. <laughs> <I love laughs> one it. of my Okay, <laughs> but um, I, I am going to press back on like. So you said COVID was the accelerator. Um, bring me to that like day or that week, um, just because uh, this is the number one thing that students have asked me for. It's like, tell me what was in your mind, because you know a lot of them have a secret, you know, wish and desire, or they're waiting for the right time, or they hope to be waiting for the right time. So the mindset of when you knew it was the right time. Okay, this might sound really bad. So there was two days. There was two defining moments. Um, I hope my old employer doesn't listen to this. <laughs> um, but there was two days. Um, there was. Uh, 
one day was the day that we all got sent home from um, from COVID. So we were all told, you know, go work from home. And at that point, I'd been doing enough of the different dabbling that I knew I was going to leave corporate and start my own, my own business of some form, but I had no idea what that form was going to be. So I remember packing up my things that day and making a mental decision um, that I knew we were going to be working from home for a long time. But I told myself, I will have started my business before we return to the office. So I didn't know when, but I knew um, I was, I, I kind of like, I remember seeing my, my desk and saying, I'm not coming back here. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I was a hundred percent set on that. But at that point, I still didn't know what my business was going to be. And I didn't know when it was going to happen. I just knew like, okay, the work from home, I can let it happen for a particular period of time. Um, so then I started getting a lot more invested in like, it was kind of like a decision point where I was like, Hey, I've got to figure it out. And I, I scrambled, I did all kinds of different like versions of it. But I, at that point, I kind of had that momentum to say, I'm going to figure out a way I just didn't know, but it was like, it was a defining moment from that. You were in your car. Yeah. You're in your car driving from the East coast to the West coast again. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. It was like, that was the decision point. And then and then I think I kind of got a little bit scared again, where I was like, I, um, like I was making good money and it was a pretty cushy job, like not good, but it was, a, it was a good job, right? It yeah. was, um, you know, I was director of accounting and finance. It was decent for like work-life balance. You know, the work was really interesting. The people were good to get along with, yeah. you know, it was, it was a good, it was a good paying job. There wasn't a real, it was like it's easy to get comfortable doing that. And then I was looking at like my business and I was like, Hey, well, I don't see the same financial return with my business. So I kind of said, okay, I'm just going to stick it out as long as I can. And then just see how far I can get doing this on the side. And my second defining moment is maybe bad to say. Um, but yeah, so they, they announced that we weren't getting bonus and I was like, today's the day. So I gave my resignation that day. Um, because no, I, I love this. And I'll explain to you why, why we were destined to meet after I'll let you okay. finish, but this is awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I think I could tell that like the reason I was doing that work was, um, it wasn't because I was drawn to the purpose. It wasn't because I really cared about the work. I was doing it to get a paycheck. Um, you know, despite it being comfortable for a million different reasons, I, I was not attached to like the, why we were doing anything. It was truly just financial driven. And whenever the money wasn't there, I was like, um, I'm, I'm done. Absolutely. So, um, tell me if you can relate to this, but when I was in industry, uh, I definitely tied, you know, not my purpose, but my sense of value to, um, to the money, because, you know, if it goes up or if there's, um, a bonus, like that's them showing you that they value your work. It's, you know, a thank you and financial reward. And you do, or I at least got stuck up, not necessarily in spending all that I was making, yeah. but definitely valuing myself based on, on other people's metrics. And so something very similar is why I left uh, industry, which let me, let me go to, um, you know, educational co consulting full-time and that and eventually led to Dal is yeah, the same thing. They announced that <laughs> bonuses weren't being paid. And, um, <laughs> it's funny because, um, I tell my students now and I was like, okay, like we talk, call them bonuses and how do we account for them? They're as bonuses. And I'm like, but if you do something year in, year out, and there's a set metric and if you hit the metrics. And then they're not paid for some other external things. That's actually more demotivating. And you'll, you'll have people that leave. And I'm like, so, you know, for myself, I think it was something like, um, and I've seen people get upset about bonuses when they are 20, 30, 40, $50,000 richer um, than they were five minutes ago, but they see their friend get $2,000 more. So there's, there's a whole level of compensation. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so yeah, it's, it's absolutely relative. Like, so for no, us, um, I, I left yeah. for the exact same reasons and it led me down the path to where I am now. So I love that you shared it. It's not <laughs> bad. And it, it's almost like a gut check because you're like, yeah. oh, okay, this is what I needed to realize that this is what I'm getting out of the situation. And it's not bad. And it's a very, like, I know for myself, it's, it's a privileged position to be in. And I recognize that privilege, but another part about being like a leader or, you know, some being true to myself is like saying, okay, when you recognize that now, what, right? So kudos to you, you recognize it and you're like, now what? And you gave your notice. And I did. Yeah, I, I did. I was like, it, yeah, that was my, that was 
that was my thing. But it's so true, right? And like so much of what you make, um, I forget the details of it, but there was some study I had read at one point where they were saying like, would you rather um, oh, make yes. a lower absolute dollar amount? I'm forgetting the numbers, but like you would make a lower absolute dollar amount, but you would make more than everyone around you or a higher absolute dollar amount, but less than everyone around you. And it's crazy, but people would choose to actually have less financial, but because there's an element of like significance, I think people end up attaching to it. At, like you encapsulated that perfectly. And I still see it um, fits in, you know, Bob's in different areas. Uh, one of my colleagues would say that he sees it in different social status um, areas in like the university or outside. And we, yeah, we do almost have this way of, okay, how are we going to, um, you know, where do we stand relative to others, like you said. So it's, uh, it's interesting. And to take a step out of that and observe it, become the observer of our own lives. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't think it hurts. And I, have you, this may be getting personal and you feel free to yeah. say pass, but have you lost any friends um, because you decided to go um, out on your own? Or um, I think that I realized that some of my work friends were work acquaintances is what I would say, um, yeah. where where you realize, and, and that actually kind of, it, it hurts, but it's actually a good thing to realize because what you end up finding whenever you're working in a job is you become friendly with the people that you're working with because you're around, you know, there's probably a group of like 10 or so individuals, no matter what company you're working in or what industry, that becomes 10 people or so that you spend the vast majority of your time together, just not because you actively sought them out as your friend, but because you're in the same environment, you, you, they, they become your your work friends yeah. and I think you end up realizing when you do something different um either you realize that it was a friendship of convenience and it doesn't continue and it doesn't last or sometimes your life decisions um make other people uncomfortable so so yeah that definitely um happened to a certain extent but I'm glad that that happened because I think I think you realize that the people friends and the people that have been my friends you know across different companies etc like they're the ones that are like they're like you seem so different you seem so happy you're like they're the people that are there rooting for you so I think it's a yeah. good thing to realize like I I can see how it would be a huge danger if I had you know continued on the same path and you you spend like if I hadn't spent you know two years but I had spent you know 10 years or 20 years and then you realize you know, you spent 10, 20 years investing in a friendship that was not actually a friendship. It was just truly a work acquaintance, you, you know? So yeah. yeah. And, and I do think it's, I do think those kind of decisions, whenever you do something, it, it does make some people uncomfortable, whether, whether it's out of a good place of their true legitimate concern for you, or whether it just triggers in them some discomfort that it's kind of like, you're, you're no longer saying that what they're doing has the same yeah, like you, you're you're doing something that makes other people uncomfortable. So I did experience that with with some individuals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there because it's not all you know sunshine and rainbows, but it's also how you decide to look at it as well, and having that perspective to say, hey, this is what happened, and maybe it sucked in the moment, but I'm okay, and I'm I'm oh, I'm okay for it, and I'm perhaps like welcome that now and it's good and it's kind of neat because now you know if you had you know like all of us kind of friendships out of convenience like we can kind of choose to use that energy and invest it in ourselves and invest it in education invest it in perhaps you know just reaching out and saying hey like you did something cool like want to talk so yeah, and exactly. being open and available to have conversations like I'm yeah. I'm loving getting to know you um yeah. and so <laughs> thank you it's so true. And then you get to be, I think, more intentional. Like, I think more mm. intentional about your friendships and more intentional about, like, the people that you're surrounding yourself with. So much of when you're working a traditional, you know, nine to five job, which realistically is usually more of a nine to nine job, um, like, it's, it, you don't, you either don't have the time to be able to, you don't, you don't have the same level of flexibility to choose who you're necessarily spending your time around. It just depends on who are the other people working in your organization. And that's, that dictates so much of your waking time. So yeah, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm really grateful that it happened. It kind of, in some ways, sort of, it kind of hurt actually like at the point in time that it happened, but I'm really glad that it did because it, it helped me get more clarity on things. And, and yeah, you just become a lot more intentional, but like where you're investing your time and your effort and your friendships. Like I do think friendships matter hugely um, in life and career in, in all of that. Um, so yeah, friendships of convenience are not, they're not worth it. 
All right. So we've taught, we've kind of, we've dabbled around this that I, you know, bring it to me. What yeah. is your business? What are you doing? Like what? Okay. I want to hear all about it. We are trying, so it's baby business. Like I said, I, our official quote unquote launch date was October of 2020. Um, so we're in the early stages. Um, what I'm trying to do is fully disrupt the e-learning space and the landscape for energy companies, utilities, and regulators. Um, we use a lot of um, high tech and so I shouldn't say high tech, we use a lot of technologies and softwares um, to be able to kind of take a lot of the training that's been happening and bring it to more of like an online virtual interactive type of environment. Um, we're trying to disrupt the traditional e-learning vendors. Um, so I view competition as a good thing. It makes each vendor co competition yeah. makes other people stronger. Um, but we're out to we're out to definitely compete in that space. Um, so right. if you look at the traditional model, one hour of e-learning content costs about thirty thousand um, dollars. We said that is insane. That's ridiculous. Um, so companies are paying it, um, but those. Um, we offer the same thing, but we offer it for more like 4K. So basically it's like pennies on the dollar compared to what they're doing. Um, and the reason we're able to do it differently is we go after one industry and one industry only. So mm. a traditional e-learning provider, they'll have their project managers, their instructional designers. They'll do a course in a grocery store, a manufacturing company, a pharmacy. They'll kind of go all over the place. Um, we work exclusively in the energy industry um, because we know it and we have very um, strong processes and knowledge and, and kind of a, a database set up in that particular space. We can cut out so much of the learning curve that yes. people would do if they were coming in from it from a different space. So we basically cut out a lot of it. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of the, the gist of like we're really trying to be able to deliver um, far more affordable e-learning and far more creative e-learning. Yes. So if you look at the traditional, um, I don't know how many of your students would have actually probably gone through corporate training yet, um, but I've said- Oh, oh um, I will say we do have a 12 month um, co-op, um, mandatory co-op. So by the time they're listening to this, they've gone through eight or 12 months. So a lot yeah. of them would have been, I would say subjected to a lot yes. of the traditional um, corporate so they learning. Can feel the pain. So some of those courses that I've sat through, you know, those annual mandatory trainings, um, no, no criticism of them, but okay. Yes. Criticize them there. It's like, you would think someone woke up and said, we're going to try and make this as boring and as dry and as painful. We're going to try. And I think they took the binders them. and they just yeah. photocopied them and then put them online. And they're like, we're online. We, like, every time yeah, regulated too. oil and gas is where like, that's where I spent a decent chunk of time, um, both as an auditor and then on the other side and the binder that you had to like, and it was like, it was passed down. It was the same binder from the eighties. And then I'm pretty sure that when they digitized, they legit just photocopied it. And they probably did spend $30,000 per credit hour to it, throw it on there. Yeah, that and, is exactly it. It's yeah. 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 So, okay. So just within that, um, because kind of the value proposition, correct me if I'm wrong, is that with traditional e-learners, uh, it's, there's a lot of ramp up. So time. Yes. Um, and with time, money, invest on both sides. And as well as like um, inefficiencies for, for the client really to try to have to educate. But with you, they get a dynamic um, team. Um, they get a subject matter expert and an educational um, designer and developer. So like exactly. a, a, yeah, a combo. Exactly. That's exactly it. So we do, what we try to do is make it really, really light on their subject matter experts. So we do a lot of our own research. Um, part of actually in doing my MBA, and this is where like you look back and you don't realize at the time where things are going to lead up, but yeah. my MBA actually, um, my graduate project was around um, knowledge management and learning and kind of some instructional design concepts specifically applied to utilities and specifically applied to how utilities can, can build out their regulatory acumen. Um, so at the time I had no idea where and how that would actually fit into something, but I used a lot of that because they say that, um, especially in these really specialized areas, 99% of your, your knowledge is in someone's head. It's not written down. It's not even like you can go and get the binder to dust it off. Like if you can, what you're dusting off is probably highly outdated. So you have all of this like implicit knowledge in people's heads. And if That's you don't so have risky for, business. for getting it out and yeah. making it explicit, 
you can't do that. And if you're brand new to these industries, they're complex industries. Like they're very, very complicated. Um, so if you don't know what questions to be able to ask and you don't have enough of a basis in the industry, of course you're gonna, of course it's gonna legitimately cost you 30K to put that together because that's what it takes to kind of get a, a foundation to be able to create yeah. something. Um, so yeah, we kind of said, all right, we're not going to try to be everything for everyone. We're not going to, um, yeah, we're, we're going to, there's all kinds of lucrative opportunities in e-learning space with other industries. We're not touching them. We're not going near that. We're going to, um, we're going to really like crush it in this field and get amazingly good at it and, um, and bring more creativity. Like that is the aspect that I really, really love. And um, again, like when we were talking about the perspectives earlier, I never dreamt that, um, watching a masterclass video about documentary filmmaking for like historical documentaries would be relevant, but you kind of pick up on them and you're like, oh, interesting. And they use storytelling elements and you start to realize like, okay, well, when you're doing training, you can actually use storytelling elements as well. Like we, really? we do things where we put people into like, we pretend you're kind of like a mini detective and you have to, like, we just do all kinds yeah. of random things. You know, we- Oh, gamification, fun stories, yeah. making it sticky, you know, yeah. pairing it, like having your knowledge castle, right. Yes. Um, or knowledge pa or, um, what is it? Memory palace where you can kind of yeah. do association. Yeah. Exactly. No, all of these things. And like yeah. training doesn't have to suck. I don't know. If it, like yeah. Yeah. it's so many. That should be our tagline. Oh, we don't have a tagline, but I like, I love it. If you don't mind, I might steal your tagline. Please, like, go for it. Stop. Yeah. I'd be honest. Like, <laughs> we, we don't have one yet, but like, that's just like, that's kind of the, the premise is like you, because if you make it so dry, people are not going to remember the information. They're not going to retain it. They're not going to use it. And if it's important enough to train someone on it, it's important enough for that person to remember it. So you have to find ways to make it interesting. And, and we're just no longer like in 2021, we're no longer in a model where people are just going to read text heavy content. Like you have to include video elements and audio elements and and vignettes and just make it more engaging and more interactive so that's what we're that's what we're doing and it's a big place like there's um seven million people at least in North America that work in the utility space and and far more if you look at it broadly the energy industry overall so it's a it's a big it's a big playground to be able to play in and and there's there's so much that we can do in it so yeah that's what we're that's what we're about that's what we're going after fantastic okay so what is um do you first of all do you have an average week like what does an average week look like as uh <laughs> as a co-founder ceo not really not really no. it's like it's changing um i i do honestly spend a lot of time on my own personal development and training development because um, entrepreneurship is dramatically different than working as a corporate employee. Um, so I, I have, um, I actually just fairly recently, I went through um, an accelerator program um, with, um, it's called Acti, but it's a phenomenal program, but it's with 10 other entrepreneurs. Um, I think towards the end, we were eight, we had a couple that, that left the program, um, but you would, we would meet and we, we got taught by probably 20 different um, other entrepreneur instructors in their own area of specialty. So everything nice. from search engine optimization to like insurance to payroll aspects, but you would hear about it from other entrepreneurs. So um, nice. I was doing that like while well, kind of getting things um, lined up, but I'm always trying to find, you know, what are other things that, um, yeah, like I, I spend a lot of my time trying to make sure that I'm upskilling myself as well. Um, but it, it varies. It's, 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 yeah, it's a good yeah. thing. I, I do something very similar, right? And if you're in education, you kind of need to value education, yeah, right? You gotta walk the talk, right? You can't be yeah. like, oh yeah, I believe in education. <laughs> you should go learn things. <laughs> yeah, you go learn. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> no, I think that some of the best teachers are also the best students and learners. Like it's a continuum, yeah. right? Yeah. Where we're all just kind of going back and forth between learning and teaching and sharing and collaborating. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Cool. Um, so we talked, um, we, I, I love this and how this involved. What, like, just want to throw it in there. What do you do for fun? Um, you have all this work and learning and you have a, you know, a beautiful daughter. Um, like what, what does some like, um, you know, are you a spa person? Are you, <laughs> do you go to like, I don't know, the paintball range? <laughs> no paintball, no paintball. I have zero athletic skills. I have none of those. Um, I, I think, COVID world and non-COVID world. Yes. Um, I've been kind of finding, I think since COVID, I've kind of gone deep into the business, but it's kind of, it's weird to say, but like working on my business is fun. So Absolutely. right now, you know, eventually at some point when the world opens up again, I'll kind of get into some more things, but I've been kind of redirecting a lot of my, um, and like if it was non-COVID world, I love 
love food. I love restaurants. I love game nights with friends. It's normal stuff, right? Um, but with a lot of the restrictions, I've really funneled a lot of like my energy and fun into building the business. But once things level, once things kind of open up again, um, traveling, I'm a big fan. Um, I booked myself a trip to Fiji in November. I'm super excited for. Um, but I believe in like bringing kids to different parts of the world. So like when my daughter was, she's six now, but um, almost seven, she would tell you. But when she was four, I brought her to um, China. So um, just the two of us, we yeah. went to uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and uh, Beijing, China. And it was really cool. Like she probably would have been just as happy if I brought her to a pool, but um, anywhere in Calgary. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, traveling to different parts of the world, I just think there's such cool, like there's so much to see that you don't have to stick between like gray cubicles and spend 100%, yeah. like just get out there and do get, stuff, right? Get out and explore. One of our other guests, uh, Nikki, actually said that like her goal in life is to travel the world like with her kids so yeah. she's um an educational consultant and then yeah like they, they took um right before covid um their kids were in australia and i think they're like nine and six so you know they're they're not going and doing the disneyland thing not that there's anything wrong with it but um she they have another thing they have a trip planned to bali She's like, I don't know when it's like, we booked the tickets, so it's done. Um, and whenever we can go post COVID, like we're going and there's just other trips and yeah, it's like, I believe it's Portugal. And like, just like you said, um, just get out there. I love China and Fiji. It will be, I've heard nothing but great, great wait, things about Fiji. Yeah, wait, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm excited. I was like, and by November, by November, we gotta be like reopened. So fingers <laughs> crossed, fingers crossed. Hey, so. I also, um, I like to look forward to things and I'm also a big person about like just not how do I say this not dwelling on what could be but like saying no like I'm going to look forward to this up until the point when it's not yeah. responsible exactly. <laughs> like, it's just totally. um I have some people in my life and it's it's you know difficult when you have fun and exciting news and then they point out what could go wrong with it and it's yeah. like I'm a big girl. I know yeah. exactly what can go wrong, yeah. um, but I'm going to choose to focus my energy on what will go right. And I'm going to continue this forward momentum and involve like people around me that will, you know, light me up and do that. And then every once in a while, you know, life is going to smack me on my ass, but guaranteed it's when I'm not looking for it. <laughs> like yeah. I'm going to miss it. It's going to yeah. lay me out and then I will get up and people will help me and exactly. the world will continue. Like it, everything works out in the end. You it, know, it's like, it works it, it out. Out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Um, what advice would you have? And like you've embodied advice. Um, but if you were to say, Hey, um, third year going to fourth year accounting particular, their final year, what advice did you have for current Dal accounting majors or management majors in general, if you want to yeah. broaden it? Hmm. It could be partly a book. Um, if you yeah. want, sorry, I'm okay. interrupting your thinking. I will like, say a few things. Okay. I will say, um, think of your skill set as kind of being an overall portfolio. So um, think of it as like, get really, really good at accounting and get your accounting experience, but you don't know how some related complementary skills are going to benefit you. So don't be so exclusively saying like, I have to only get, um, so, so if you, for example, really want to get a job with one of the big four firms or one of the big firms and you don't get it, don't feel like your life is over. Um, you, you don't know where different things are going to land. So I was in a co-op program and ultimately I, I was in the role where initially I did eventually kind of go with one of the big firms, but I didn't get selected by any of the firms. And I was just kind of a little bit crushed. And I was like, Oh, what does this like, this is awful. And it was the best thing that ever could have happened. So I worked on uh, my co-op term was in the forensic investigations group of a federal government department. And it was like mind, like it was the <laughs> best co-op term you could have ever imagined. And then interestingly enough, that specific skill set, which I did not think of like, investigations and forensic and forensic auditing and all of that actually led to like another thing and another thing and another thing so it's like the best thing that could have ever happened to me was actually things not working out the right way so I would say and also like don't worry and don't stress like things are gonna be okay um yeah just take on new things take them on with a lot of enthusiasm um yeah try to get as much skills doing as many different things as you can um try to find some ways to stand out in the marketplace um 
you know, I was just, uh, funny enough, just this morning, I'd seen a post that someone shared that like less than 38% of job applicants, I think they were saying, don't even include a cover letter. Um, so like, it's the bar is not wow. as high as you would think. So find a way to be a little bit creative, right? Like if you find a way to, um, um, you know, send a video introduction to an employer, yeah. um, or find a, find a company that actually doesn't have a job posting and reach out and say, Hey, I'd like to volunteer 10 hours of my time doing X, Y, Z and get really, really productive doing something for them. Um, when we had, like I said, I'm a kind of a baby business, but whenever we had first started out, we did an internship program that was not paid. We do have some, some paid roles coming up now, but at that point in time, we, we, we were just starting. We weren't sure if we were going to go this student route and the student was phenomenal. And then because I had worked with her and I knew what she was like, I was like, we're hiring you. And so now she, now she works with us in, in a paid role, but had she just kind of done the traditional route of like, here's my job application. I would have been like, oh, thanks for not hiring right now, but just putting in like, again, and it doesn't have to be astronomical, but you put in 10 hours with any company you would love to work with. Like, you don't know if that's going to pay off, but you do that enough times. And I guarantee you it'll yeah. pay off with something. Right. So so yeah, I would say like, don't stress. And sometimes when you get quote unquote, like rejected, um, it's actually the best thing that could happen to you. It, yes. All of that. I can't, I'm just <laughs> going to put a big exclamation point on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, wow. I can relate so much with that. And I wish somebody would have t- told me that <laughs> a few <laughs> different times. <Yes. laughs> it's hard to get out of the here and now. Yeah. Um, okay. This one can sometimes be a little bit of a stumper, but I always ask, um, what is your definition of success? Hmm. I would say freedom. To me, it's total freedom. Um, I want to have freedom over how I spend my time. Um, I want to have freedom to be able to pursue different things. Um, when I was again, kind of in the corporate role and how I knew it wasn't for me is like, I would look at my boss's job and my boss's boss's job and all of those different roles. And I'd be like, I don't want any of those roles because to me, that wasn't freedom. You know, for some people that might be, they would love to do that role. That's great for them. But I looked at it and I was like, okay, so I would not be able to go to Fiji because it's so far away. I would not be able to be open to just doing all kinds of different, like you just, it, it was I like the idea of I can craft my week with with freedom. Um, And I think there's a danger when you start your business. Um, And this is one of the things that I'm still working through some growing pains on it and and probably will for a little while. But I don't want to build a business that I am going to be chained to it you know, a hundred percent of the time, like I want to build it, but I'm going to be the owner of a business. But again, I don't want to fall into the trap that I think some, some entrepreneurs end up falling into is that you become a slave yeah. to your business as well. And then you no longer have freedom either. Um, so for me, Fantastic. it's like, it's freedom. I'm not there yet, but I want to be able to um, either have the financial means to be able to do something because I want to do it, not because, oh, it pays this particular amount or like, because I have to pay the bills. I want to be like creating stuff because I love what I'm actually creating. And I just want to be able to have like the, I do at some point, I haven't figured out when, but at some point I'm going to take my daughter and we're going to go live in France for a month. I just really want to do that. It's been on my bucket yes. list forever. You will. And I, I know will. you will. I totally yeah. will do that at some point. So that to me is just being able to do things just because you're like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> why not? That, that's what I want. <laughs> like, why are you yeah. going to go do that? Well, why wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. That's a good enough reason. Freedom. <laughs> Freedom. Freedom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had it. I had a feeling we would get along. So I'm glad. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Come oh. to France with us. <laughs> oh, um, yes. <laughs> I will be there. Um, it's funny too, in yoga, um, I am not like a yogi, but I, I love it. And I think it's so important to kind of do things that you feel uncomfortable with, right? Um, in different areas. And in yoga, they always say it's the intention of. They're like, okay, half bind, full bind the intention of. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm thinking, okay, um, I don't know if I can do this or, you know, I don't know if this will work out. And it's like, screw this. Like it's the intention of, it's the intention of like working towards freedom because in within that search, that in itself is freedom, the intention of. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, this is it. Um, I would love to link, uh, to whatever contact information, um, you would want to share or any videos or anything, um, to kind of 
showcase um, the fabulous human and, um, you know, founder uh, and CEO. Uh, so I will be linking that in our description. Um, and are you open if people want to send you an email or something sure. to say hello? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we are, um, you can find us, you can Google regulatory learning lab. Um, so we should show up at the very top if we don't let me know, but I'm sure that we do because we figured <laughs> yeah. out that I, 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 one of the courses I did was how do you do search engine optimization? And kind of speaking of experiments, um, I started a YouTube channel. It is still very much kind of baby stages. Haven't quite figured it out, but we've got a YouTube channel. Um, initially, I think we were at like three subscribers and my mom and brother were one of them, but we're growing so come subscribe to it we're figuring out exactly what it's going to look like and yeah reach out anytime we do have um, a couple roles that we're going to be looking for students for um starting in may i want to say may 10th um that we're going to kind of be looking for some students to do some video on so that is on ripen r-i-i-p-e-n but yeah reach out anytime perfect um yeah all of that will be linked below uh i am subscribed or i will be in the next five five <laughs> seconds <laughs> Yay, we're four subscribers. Yes. Oh no, you can subscribe to me. I, I, I'm not brave enough to show my subscriber count. Um, but because you know, we're doing it a lot of times just for the love and for sharing and to yeah, kind of and bring people into our know. orbit and see yeah, you lift just, up you people do doing cool shit and you know, grow the pie. Exactly, exactly. I love it. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. This was so much fun. I love it. I <laughs> definitely want to keep in touch. This has been cool. Okay, I will, yes, you just try to, <laughs> try to give me away. <laughs> Thank you. It. Thanks, friends.